Have you ever thought just how lucky you are to be alive? To be a living being? No human being has ever seen a live Ictosaurus and no one will ever be able to see one. Massive extinctions took place millions of years ago, so long ago that life had time to start again from zero, leaving behind creatures that were lost forever in the transformation suffered by a young, inexpert and changing world. No human being, not you, not your children, nor your children's descendants, will ever be able to see a living marsupial wolf despite the fact that our grandparents shared the world with them. None of us will ever be able to see a dodo, nor a moa, nor a giant orc. We are the most efficient agent of a phenomenon which is as old as life itself, the extinction of species. But we are becoming so efficient in our role as destroyers that as we begin to understand the interdependent mechanisms of life on Earth, we are realizing that perhaps our own activities could end up leading our species along the road to extinction. Life is, above all, a mystery. As far as we know, our universe is a superb mirage of the laws of physics, chemical convulsions, and silent, colossal, and almost eternal geological travelers. Incredibly beautiful, but all of them dead. Or almost all of them. Tiny blue speck in a dark, dead immensity. The Earth. The hand of God or an unthinkable coincidence of random physical and chemical combinations have produced an extraordinarily varied world where life has experimented for millions of years, giving rise to different, interdependent and ever-changing forms of life. The Earth became a planet of possibilities for life. Each ecosystem, each niche, each space on the earth or beneath the sea was exploited by biological prototypes that have gradually taken shape as the passage of eras changed the conditions of the natural environment. The species changed as the planet matured. The first living beings did not appear until almost 4,000 million years after an explosion. For us, unimaginable, though small on the scale of the universe, gave rise to the solar system. But following the first pulsations of life, it immediately began its relentless mutations. The forms of life multiplied 
varying their bodies, their capacities, and their requirements for subsistence. The complexity of living beings increased, animals and plants diversified. The new species were more complex and sophisticated. They even became sociable, giving rise to behavior that favored the survival of the group above that of the individual. And the earth was filled with specialists, marvelous biological entities capable of perpetuating themselves. Life spread to every corner of our small, extraordinary planet. But in this process of experimentation and change, there were failures as well as successes. Terrestrial and extraterrestrial factors marked eras of great changes during which life had to start all over again. From the time the first living being appeared to the present day, these great changes have wiped out 99% of all the species that have ever existed. And they did so in specific periods of time, millennia marked by unusual mortality, which we have called massive extinctions. Since the first animal fossil register approximately 800 million years ago, the Earth has suffered at least 12 massive extinctions, of which five were of truly gigantic proportions. Millions of species disappeared forever in these periods of massive deaths, but always some plants and animals remained as a point of departure for renewed diversification. Now in the first years of the 21st century, a new extinction appears to be ravaging the planet with unusual virulence destroying species at a speed hundreds of times greater than that of the five previous ones. And everything seems to indicate that we are the cause, the agents of this sixth massive extinction. When we hear of extinctions in prehistory, we tend to think of the time when the Earth was inhabited by fabulous animals, the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs dominated the zoology of our planet for 140 million years, a period which, in comparison with the history of our species, makes them almost eternal. But the dinosaurs only dominated the world for a brief period of time if we compare it with the age of the Earth. Even so, they are a fascinating example of the fragility of life. Because even though they were the most formidable, powerful beings that have ever lived on our planet, they could do nothing against the forces of the cosmos. A force almost impossible to imagine came from space. The giants would become a memory in their size, their fearsome weapons, and their aggressiveness would be of no use to them. In the Russian roulette of the cosmos, a shot would be fired in the land of the dinosaurs. A medium-sized meteorite crashed into the Earth. It was neither the largest nor the most devastating of the many that have impacted against our planet, but the power of the impact was the equivalent of 10,000 times the detonation of all the nuclear weapons in the world. The forests burned, adding smoke to the dust raised by the impact and the eruptions of thousands of volcanoes.
the sky was covered over, preventing the sun from getting through. The climate changed radically. Without light, many plants died. And without food, the giants of our history disappeared from the earth forever. But this tragedy of the Cretaceous era was neither the first, nor the most devastating massive extinction. A volcanic crater in the interior of the jungles of Costa Rica provides a clue to what the greatest murderers of prehistory were like. These small single-cell algae are the descendants of photosynthetic bacteria that changed the world 3,000 million years ago, producing the greatest case of contamination in the history of the world, a poisoning caused by a highly aggressive gas, oxygen. Photosynthetic bacteria dominated the Earth, changing its atmosphere. But they too lost their supremacy. When life began to devour itself, that is, when the animals were able to feed on plants and other animals. Today, stromatolites, colonies of these photosynthetic bacteria, only survive in isolated places like this Australian coast, living testimony to just how ephemeral supremacy can be on our planet. Another of the great agents of extinction came with the evolution of the Earth itself. Since life began, continental drift and fragmentation have brought brutal changes in all land and marine ecosystems. The movement of the tectonic plates changed currents, winds, river courses. It changed the land relief, the coasts, the islands the structure of the world was radically altered. Surrounding the southernmost continent with cold waters, and the Antarctic froze over. Tectonic movements and the climatic repercussions they bring with them have been responsible for the disappearance of many species, in fact, the first great extinction 440 million years ago was due to the southward drift of the supercontinent Gondwana, which gave rise to a prolonged ice age in which around 75% of all the species on the planet were wiped out. Global changes in temperature generated glaciers or created deserts. They were the direct cause of all the massive extinctions, even the great extinction of the primary era, when around 96% of all living species became extinct. It was the climatic changes, yes, but in the majority of cases caused by a known enemy that came from space. Life is an ever-changing, cruel process which cares nothing for individuals or species, only the continuity of life itself. Each one of the great extinctions was followed by a new beginning, new eras of biological experimentation in which life tested out its prototypes learning from its mistakes in an endless mutation. Everything would seem to indicate that these mortalities on a massive scale are vital for evolution, the process which we are now only beginning to understand that has diversified life, making it increasingly more complex and specialized.
In the course of millions of years, life has constantly gone back to the drawing board and it is still doing so right now. But contrary to what it might at first seem, scientists are discovering that the survivors of these processes of massive extinctions are not necessarily the best prepared, but rather the luckiest. And that makes life and its evolution a worrying game of chance. Since the time we have information from the fossil record, and probably since the origin of the world, the species have not stopped changing as the planet and its habitats were modified. We could in fact say that every so often, a new world was created. Global changes, whether they be caused by the creation and drift of the continents, the impact of asteroids, or the chemical alterations generated by the metabolism of millions and millions of tiny photosynthetic beings, have made it necessary to rethink life on Earth dozens of times. New worlds and new inhabitants. That has been the general rule in the continents for 800 million years. A rule that has left by the wayside millions of species that were once as real and flourishing on our planet as we human beings are now. It doesn't matter how powerful or dominant a species was. The more specialized, the more dependent it was on the stability of its environment. But on Earth, nothing remains stable for very long. The response to new challenges gave rise to evolution. From a single cell being to a vertebrate, from a fish with scales to a dinosaur with feathers and from this to a bird. The world has never stopped changing, but life has always managed to adapt, constant renewal which demands a very high price. Along this entire path strewn with massive extinctions, there have, however, been great survivors. Families, genii and species that have continued their slow evolution, overcoming the major crises in the course of millions of years, either because their habitats have remained stable or because their evolutionary designs have enabled them to adapt to the changes. This is an estuarine crocodile, a survivor from the Cretaceous era. The first ancestors of the modern crocodiles appeared at the start of the Triassic era, approximately 230 million years ago, in a world dominated by the dinosaurs. They were new evolutionary prototypes that would prove so efficient and adaptable that they would survive to this very day. The great changes wrought by the massive extinction of the Cretaceous era brought an end to the dinosaurs, but the crocodiles nonetheless managed to survive. Today their world is very different from that of 80 million years ago, but the same adaptations, the same designs that were useful then, continue to serve them in this world of the 21st century.
Large scales protect the crocodile's body like armor plating. Their organs, their senses, their physiology in general is primitive, perhaps archaic, but it has kept them alive for millions of years. The first crocodilians were land carnivores. They had longer legs than their present-day descendants, adapted to hunting on land, but their bodies were already very similar to those of modern crocodiles. Subsequently, they progressively adapted to an amphibian lifestyle, achieving physical variations on their basic model. The typical model of the crocodiles, which they still successfully use today, and which makes them formidable predators. The designs that survived the great extinctions, such as the crocodiles, are in any case the exception to the rule. Because our world behaves like a living being constantly renewing itself, and that means new species to take over where others left off. The Earth is now a world of sophisticated specialists. Biological communities are composed of thousands of species, millions of living beings that base their lives on others in such a way that they all depend on each other. The sloth of the Amazon jungle is capable of surviving in a world of hunters as efficient and specialized as the jaguars. And it has managed to do so thanks to something as apparently simple but in practice incredibly difficult to achieve as being able to live without ever needing to go down onto the ground. The canopy of the jungle is the safest place for creatures as slow as the sloth. Up here they find food and have managed to drink from the leaves and trunks in which the rainwater collects. In addition, their adaptations to arboreal life have led them to develop a disguise based on slow movements and greenish algae, which tinge their brown hair. In exchange for such radical physiological changes, the sloths cannot flee if an enemy detects them and must always live near the thecropias on which they feed. They are therefore entirely dependent on the survival of these trees and in general the Amazon jungle. Such specialized unions as that of the sloths, the bluish-green algae that live in their hair and certain species of Amazon trees such as the thecropias have worked out so well that they have spread around the entire world. And this has brought unprecedented richness to the biodiversity of the Earth. Ecological unions have led life to diversify as never before in its long evolutionary history. But this success has its risks. Now more than ever we understand that each animal, each plant, each environmental factor can influence the lives of all the other members of a given ecosystem. In the same way as some sociable species have managed to conquer an enormous variety of environments thanks to the specializations of the individuals of the group in the different tasks required by society, so these complex ecosystems need the different members that comprise them in order to function correctly.
Seen in this way, the ecosystems and the planet as a whole behave like independent living organisms that depend on the work of each and every one of their cells, tissues, organs and organic systems. They are all important and above a certain number, they are all vital. This specialization was taken to extremes in the islands which the continental drift separated from all other land masses. Madagascar was one of them. A rose sifaka stands watch from the safety of a tree. The Sifakas, like all the group of the Limos to which they belong, arose in the evolutionary isolation of Madagascar. There are no Limas in any other part of the world, and there never have been. And the same is true of over 150,000 plant and animal species that are exclusive to this African island. The Limos appeared after Madagascar separated from the African continent. They are therefore a group that has developed without the evolutionary pressure of competition with continental species. But this absence of competition brings acute risks. All the species that developed in these evolutionary islands closely depend on their equally exclusive ecosystems. Limos, chameleons, fossas and insects geckos, iguanas, and the over 7,300 endemic plant species are the cells of the organism which is Madagascar, pieces in a living hull who could not survive without each other. And this affects both animals and plants, large and small, hunters and prey. The travelers of these islands of independent evolution can teach us much not only about how life diversifies, but also about the fragility of life on Earth. They are small-scale worlds, examples reflecting the destiny of the entire planet in a much shorter period of time. On the other side of the Indian Ocean, a much larger island conserves species which show us what the world might have been like without the placentary mammals. The interior of the prehistoric jungles of Australia is still home to the descendants of the distant Gondwana, the southern supercontinent that split apart 50 million years ago. This echidna is a representative of a lineage that became obsolete when the mammals acquired the ability to develop their young inside them thus freeing themselves from the older formula, which was to lay eggs. Along with the monotremes, the name given to this group of egg-laying mammals, Australia also has another type of mammal, the marsupials, who complete the development of their young inside pouches or marsupia. The marsupials and the majority of the species originating in the distant Gondwana 
had left behind the continental competition faced by the plants and animals in the rest of the world. But Australia would also subject them to harsh tests. When Australia became an independent island, it began a slow journey northwards. Over thousands of years, the island approached warmer latitudes, and that brought progressive but important climatic changes in its interior. The warming of that young Australia might well have led to a massive localized extinction. But the process was so slow that the Australian animals had time to adapt and evolve. Now in the Australian night, we can see some of the new prototype marsupials that have managed to adapt to the heat so well that they have turned the desert into their habitat. The case of Australia is a perfect example demonstrating how in the massive extinctions that have ravaged our planet, there is one factor that determines the ability of the Earth and life to resist. And that factor is time. The impact of a meteorite is an aggression of such speed and magnitude that it unleashes the destruction of millions of species. But gradual changes, the progressive transformations of our world, allow evolution time for its species to adapt to the new conditions. And it is that ability that has permitted, despite the great extinctions, for life to recover time and time again. If life is given time, it demonstrates that it can be adaptable and flexible. The Australian cassowaries are descendants of the gigantic birds that lived in the supercontinent Gondwana. Those giants weighing over 500 kilos gave rise to the African ostriches, the South American nandos, and the emus and cassowaries of Oceania. In a world of smaller animals and scarier resources, there was no place for those monstrous birds, so their descendants gradually acquired weights and sizes more in accordance with their new environments. On the other side of the world, in the jungles along the Orinoco River, a group of Hoatsins feeds among the treetops. Like so many other species, the Hoatsins came about as a response to the opportunity of feeding and living permanently in the tops of the trees of the Amazon. And as their ancestors had sufficient time, a period which geologically is not very much, but which is measured in millions of years, the result was this species, a bird vitally linked to the trees on which it feeds, a specialization that enables the Huetsins to feed without having to make long flights. For the carnivores, however, things are not as easy, and they have to hunt down their prey. Birds of prey arm themselves with claws and beaks capable of killing. In the same way as the large carnivorous dinosaurs, which we now know also had feathers, the hunters of the air needed to develop resistance, speed and skill in flight, just the opposite of the peaceful Hoatsins.
Wherever life had time, the species adapted to all types of conditions, and they still continue to do so. Among the whales of Patagonia, and for reasons that we will see in more detail in the next episode, a phenomenon is taking place that reminds us of David and Goliath. The seagulls have become so numerous that they exploit all the available resources, and the backs of the whales are an almost inexhaustible source of food. It is a surprising case, but one which demonstrates the adaptability of the species, animals that are the result of thousands of evolutionary experiments in harsh competition against other animals. Before the present day, seagulls capable of eating almost anything and colonizing any ecosystem from pole to pole, there have been dozens of different ancestors who gradually refined the most efficient features to survive in increasingly difficult conditions. It is the opposite solution to that of the super specialists, animals that are very well adapted to a specific environment, but which completely depend on it. Since the origins of life, organisms have become increasingly complex. The new species, the new prototypes of life, are more effective, more sophisticated and precise. Since life began to devour itself, that is, since the appearance of the first beings capable of feeding on other living organisms, our life has become a world of hunters and prey. Increasingly sophisticated weapons were perfected for aggression and flight to prowl and to hide, to capture the prey and flee from the hunter. It didn't matter where these new adaptations ventured in order to colonize new ecosystems. Wherever there was potential prey, in time a hunter would appear. And killing in order to survive became the general rule, an inescapable law to which we are all subject, be it as killers or as victims. When the mammals returned to the sea, they did so not once, but twice. The seals and the sea lions exploit the unlimited resources of the oceans, feeding on fish and marine invertebrates. But other mammals went further and became seal hunters. These new hunters had a well-developed social structure, a weapon that enabled them to hunt in groups. Large predators of the sea, like the sharks, were forced to give up their position in the food pyramid. These organized groups turned the rest of the marine creatures into potential prey, and not even the enormous blue whales were able to escape the threat.
Today, there is no other animal in the oceans that can compete with a family of orcas. The power of the individual is reinforced by the power of the group. Shared work and risks with shared rewards. The orcas are an example of the power of evolution and a demonstration of its axioms. If there are no sudden changes of global magnitude, the new species obey the theory of natural selection, and the best adapted survive. But when we talk about sudden changes, we are referring to the geological timescale, where thousands of years are barely an instant. And it was just an instant ago that the most modern of the biological prototypes arrived on the planet Earth. This was a different species. It didn't have claws or powerful teeth or exceptional physical aptitudes. But it did have something much more dangerous. Intelligence. The appearance of man would change the planet forever. It was a complex species capable of interpreting its surroundings in a way no other species had ever done. The natural world became an enemy to be defeated. Intelligence compensated for the lack of claws and fangs, permitting the production of weapons. Man became a fearsome hunter. Our species soon became fascinated with power. It was no longer enough to simply obtain food. Now man had power over life and death, and killing without need became one of our distinguishing traits. In their relentless search for well-being, Human beings achieved tremendous successes. Obtaining food from hunting and gathering meant periods of shortage, permanent movement, and dependency on the climate and the seasons. So the domestication of wild animals proved a brilliant solution to overcome the problem, allowing them to remain in the same place for as long as they liked. Man became sedentary and learned to cultivate the land from which he would obtain so much food that he could store the surplus for consumption during the unproductive months. These surpluses also enabled him to trade with other populations, opening up the possibility of obtaining different foods, new objects, greater well-being. And as a result, human settlements were consolidated and grew, becoming increasingly complex and more sophisticated. So different from nature that they eventually became artificial worlds, tailor-made to meet the needs of our species. With plants and animals available all year round, man had taken the decisive step towards conquering the world. It was now simply a question of time before our species proliferated, and we have certainly done that. Every year, the world population grows faster, occupying the last refuges of an increasingly overexploited nature. From the first natural caves where our ancestors found shelter, man has progressively conquered new territories. Intelligence enabled him to alter his surroundings to meet his needs, 
and our species expanded spectacularly, exponentially, unstoppably. We have changed our natural surroundings in such a way that we now could no longer live there. We have become dependent on a world of metal, plastic and glass where energy provides us with heat, protection and safety. But in order to achieve it, we are destroying the world. We have become an agent of extinction just as devastating as the drift of continents or the impact of meteorites. But we are doing it at a speed thousands of times greater. And we have already seen that life needs time in order to be able to absorb changes. But geological time, in other words, a great deal of time. The consequences of our actions have become global ecological problems. We are changing the climate of the entire Earth and the first signs can be seen where we might least expect it. Species are becoming extinct at a speed never before known in the history of the Earth. 10,000 times faster, in fact, than the speed at which new species are born. We are the cause of the sixth massive extinction. An extinction that is taking place today, right now. Scientists calculate that in the next 100 years, half of all the living beings on the planet will be in danger of extinction. A ridiculously short period on the scale of extinctions where time is measured in millions of years. We are now just beginning to understand the responsibility of being a species with the power to exterminate. But fortunately, the process can still be reversed. The intelligence that made us capable of producing changes on a planetary scale enabled us to conquer the Earth and become the lords and masters of nature can also be used to remedy our brutal, fatal mistakes. Many people have undertaken the urgent task of reversing the process of extinction we have unleashed. And every day, more volunteers join the cause. We live on a magical planet, marked by the gift of life. And though we believe ourselves to be so important and powerful, seen on a global scale with the perspective of millions of years, we are no more than an ephemeral, crazy species that is flouting all the rules. The Earth has already survived changes similar to those we are bringing about. Massive extinctions that led to the disappearance of 95% of all species. It therefore will survive all this alarming damage. And life almost certainly will return to the Earth. But unless we are capable of avoiding it, our species, like the dinosaurs, the marsupial tigers, or the ichnosauruses, will be merely a memory of an insignificant instant in the long life of planet Earth. <laughs>